this is going to be in English. Um, I asked Veronica whether I should do it in German, but fortunately for me, she said, no, you know, just switch to English, uh, which will be, by the way, much faster. So why would you produce meat in a Petri dish? It seems like a crazy idea. We have cows that do a wonderful job. Well, not quite. I have these two people. One is a um, biological anthropologist from Harvard, and the other is the director of the environmental working group at, in California, who much more eloquently than I can explain to you why we need to change something with our meat production. The story of human evolution is one that is intimately tied to meat. Once we started cooking meat, then we could get lots of energy, and that energy enabled us to have big brains and become physically, anatomically human. Hunters and gatherers all over the world are very sad if, for a few days at a time, the hunters come back empty-handed. The camp becomes quiet, the dancing stops, and then somebody catches some meat, they bring the prey into the camp, or nowadays into somebody's back garden with a barbecue, everybody gets excited to come and share the meat. It is ritually cut and passed out to people. We are a species designed to love meat. Feeding the world is a complex problem. I think people don't yet realize what an impact meat consumption has on the planet. 18% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from meat production. We're also using something like 1,500 gallons of water to produce just one pound of meat. Meat takes up about 70% of our arable lands. There's no question that if we were able to shift more of our land into intensive fruit and vegetable production, we'd be able to feed a lot more people a lot healthier diet. With the global population growing from 7 billion to 9 billion people, by 2050, the demand for meat will double. We can't just continue doing what we've been doing. Unless we make some changes in how we produce meat on this planet, we're in for a terrible reckoning. Meat consumption was part of the human species. It's been fantastically beneficial for us. And now, by some horrendous irony, it's become part of a system that threatens our species. We have to do something about it. Okay, so we, we are a species designed to love meat, and, uh, but yet we see now a lot of problems, especially for beef, actually. That's because a, a cow is really an obsolete technology in this day and age, uh, because it's very inefficient in producing meat from vegetable proteins uh, in its food. So what, what can we do? Well, we can all become vegetarians. Uh, and we have seen a number of examples in this conference of behavioral change. And we have also seen examples of technology. And those seem to be sort of the two um, opposites, um, and, and probably you can mix them, but there seems to be two, two of these opposites. So can we design a technology if we're not going to change our behavior? So, um, Yes, we can become vegetarians. And in fact, in this part of the world, meat consumption is going down. Who, by the way, of you is vegetarian? Oh, that's, that's quite a bit, which I kind of expected. It's more than the average, I guess, in, in Western Europe. That number, by the way, in Western Europe has not really changed that much in 35 years. The reason why we are eating less meat is because the meat eaters are going to eat less meat. The thing is, if we are going to change behavior, we have to do that in India and China, where for the first time people in their lives can afford meat and will reproduce our behavior. Um, so the, the increase in meat consumption of 70% in, in 2050 is not coming from going from 7 to 9 billion people, because you can do that math pretty easily and it doesn't match up, uh, but it comes from increasing consumption in India and China. That's what you see here. It's the um, uh, uh, trophic level, the human trophic level. It's where we are in the food chain. If it's one, you're a plant. If it's two, you're an animal that eats plants. If it's three, you're an animal that eats animals that eats plants. And we are at 2.35, meaning that 35% of all our proteins come from animals that eat plants. And you see in the bottom line, the pink line where India and China headed up the, next, the, the last 30 years. They gradually creep up to that same number. And why is that? Because you see that on the right, because it's linearly, linearly related with the gross domestic product of those countries. Countries become richer, more middle class incomes, they can afford eating meat, and they will. So behavioral change should include those people, and that's going to be tough. 
So what else can you do? Well, in 1932, Winston Churchill already said, well, at some point we will see the absurdity of growing an entire chicken if we only use the breast and the legs. There must be a smarter way of doing this. And um, the technology wasn't there yet. He anticipated it to, last, to take about 50 years, so we are kind of slow. Um, but recently, recently, as in the last 15 to 20 years, stem cell technology has been developed in the medical field. And um, guess what? Our muscles are really a highly regenerative tissue. They contain a lot of stem cells. And the stem cells are pretty smart creatures. They, first of all, they, so they repair the tissue in case of injury. And they cannot only do that inside of the body, they can also do that outside of the body. So when you take them out, let's say you, um, you poke a cow in the butt, take a very small sample of muscle, like one centimeter in length and a millimeter in diameter, that already has a couple of hundred of these stem cells. They can grow out, they can multiply to tremendous amounts. From one cell, you can make 10,000 kilos of meat, so you can ditch a large number of the one and a half billion cows that we have on this planet. Um, and you separate the cells, you let them uh, multiply, they do that by themselves if you feed them, um, and then something peculiar has to happen for a muscle cell to develop, they have to merge these cells. And if you starve them, interestingly enough, they start to merge, so they start to become sort of that first primitive muscle cell. Now, as you all know, muscle has to work, has to uh, uh, exercise uh, before it becomes sort of bulky and protein rich. So fortunately, these muscle cells, these, these stem cells going gradually into muscle cells are exercise junkies. They want to, they are programmed to um, contract. The only thing that we need to provide is the conditions under which they, A, can contract and B, can hold on to something so that they can develop tension, which in itself is the biggest trigger for protein synthesis. So we, we trick them in um, uh, assuming that they have an anchor point, they bite each other's in the tail, so we grow the, the tissue in a donut, and within three weeks the muscle fiber has developed into a mature muscle fiber that for all intents and purposes is indistinguishable from the muscle fiber that you take from a steak from the first supermarket. So what we did, um, we assembled, I had my technicians make tens, of, tens and thousands of these muscle fibers. It's very tedious work, I can assure you. They were not very happy. Um, and we assembled those 10,000 fibers into a hamburger. Um, pretty much showing that this technology can be used to create edible meat. That is essentially the same as meat from a cow. We took the very unusual decision to present this to the world in a hybrid between the cooking show and a press conference. And this is a very short um, excerpt of that. It was um, presented in a Petri dish, um, cooked by a very courageous cook. This hamburger costed a quarter of a million euro. And uh, he didn't burn it, fortunately. Um, it was eaten by um, uh, Hanni Rutzler from uh, Vienna. Um, she volunteered. Um, and uh, she decided that this was meat, <laughs> which was great. Um, uh, the, 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 the taste was not you know, worth the, the quarter million euro, but um, she decided that it was meat and that was the first step, much better than every other substitute that she has ever seen. So that's nice, you have a proof of concept, um, we have shown that we can do this, we have also sensitized the public, we used that same press conference to say, well, you know, guys, this is, this is going to become a problem. You know, in 2050, we will not be able to produce that amount of meat that we need. And by the way, these cows are belching methane every second that they um, uh, ferment grass. So it's, it's really a big contribution to our CO2 and methane emission and thereby uh, climate change. So we need to do really something about it. Okay. So how do you go about that? How, you, how do you make a product from a prototype? Well, first of all, you have to show that it's sufficient, that it's sustainable, meaning that all the materials that go in there are no longer dependent on um, animal um, tissues because they will, they will run out. And last but not least, um, it's actually not last, uh, one but last, uh, but st definitely still not least. Um, it has to mimic meat, because we are a species designed to love meat and not meat substitutes. Guys, we don't need animal proteins, that's a myth. We can perfectly, I mean, there, there are a number of vegetarians here, as you can see, they're alive, they're uh, healthy, uh, they're listening to these stories, maybe they ask, ask questions. You can all do that on a vegetarian diet. 
thank you. <laughs> um, and, and not only that, there are two billion people, they are vegetarian, involuntarily, mostly. So we are a species designed to love meat and not meat substitutes. So it has to mimic meat. Uh, you saw that hamburger, it was, it was okay. Now, how about efficiency? We have, we have worked through all these processes we, because we have, in a culture, we have everything under control. You can make it more efficient at some point. So, this is a preliminary life cycle analysis of the University of Oxford saying that we can reduce the amount of land by 90%, water by 90%, and energy about 60-70%, which is, would be pretty good if we reach that. And I think we can reach that. Um, we have to scale up production, which we are currently doing. At least we are setting up the technology to scale up that uh, production. In view of the time, I cannot really uh, comment too much on the, the technology. And you might think, you know, meat is not only muscle. We have bones in there. We have uh, fat tissue in there. Can you make that as well? Well, one of the comments on that hamburger was there's no fat. So we are currently producing fat. There is not a lot of medical technology uh, available to produce fat. There was no real need for it. Um, but we, this, um, uh, it was, was described, so we are currently making fat tissue, and here you see an example of that, and we're using natural fatty acids to make that. What is interesting is that we might coerce these fat cells, these, these stem cells that turn into fat cells into making omega-3 fatty acids so that that hamburger becomes more healthy for you. So once you... Once you um, realize that you can do this in a different way, you can also play with it a little bit. The fourth condition is that people need to eat it. And that's not um, at all obvious. Uh, when we presented this, it was called Yuck and uh, Frankenburger and all these sort of horrible names, um, which I really, really liked. But the Yuck, I, quite, I didn't quite understand because I sort of erroneously uh, converted it to taste. And only 15 people on this planet has tasted this hamburger. Um, so, you know, that, that could not be the case. So what is it? What is it that, that we have sort of reservations against this? And, and what is meat eating, actually? Why do we eat meat? That those questions come up, um, and that's why I'm interested in conferences like this, because there are people from many disciplines thinking about this same problem, and they can get probably much, much better insight or much better ways to communicate that than I as a biomedical scientist. Okay, so I didn't know what to do with that. Fortunately, we had some polls, we had some surveys that um, were quite uh, sort of encouraging in London or in, the, in Great Britain. They uh, asked, you know, are you in favor of this technology? 68% of the people said yes. Uh, we did a poll a survey under a cross-section of the Dutch population where 50% said I would buy it if it was available in the supermarket. That's all nice. That's an intellectual exercise. You don't know really when they, if they're going to eat it, if it's in front of their plate or if they're going to choose for it if it's in the supermarket. Okay, so one of the interesting things is it's, it's unknown. And uh, that is interesting to me because, um, you know, I, I usually, depending on the nationality of the audience, I try to find an example of what you eat and you actually don't know what's in it or how it's being produced. So a hot dog is a perfect example. If you ask Americans, do you eat hot dogs, they all say yes. If you ask them, do you know what's in it, they all say no. And I really don't want to know. Um, so that's interesting that you can eat something. We are perfectly capable of eating something that we don't know what's in it or how it's being made. So why is that? I think, you know, my interpretation is I see my neighbors eat hot dogs and they stay alive. So it's a, it's a safety issue. It's unknown and we don't know whether it's safe. Well, that can be, that's a matter of time. If a lot of people like Honey stay up, uh, stand up and eat this and they show, and I saw, the, I saw her two, year, two days ago, she's still alive, um, um, that, they, that they stay alive, that gradually will sort of provide that confidence that it's a safe product. Of course, you have to go through regulations to um, illustrate that. The second is a loss of control over how our food is being produced. We, and that's sort of the natural, unnatural argument. I hear that a lot, and I don't really know what's natural and unnatural. Those definitions don't work for me. But again, that's related to um, control over how our food is being produced. So if it's, if it's a cow that has evolved over two million years by checks and balances in nature, we tend to think it's safe and we tend to think it's, it's natural, although we all sort of know that it's no longer natural. Um, so we developed a little story, actually design students from um, Eindhoven University just developed the story of Pookie. Pookie is a pig that's living in a farm in um, a neighborhood in Vienna. 
uh, and it has only two siblings. So there are only three pigs in that farm, three cows and three chickens. And um, he is fed by kids uh, from the primary school. They have given him this name, Pookie. Um, once in a while, we poke this pig in the butt, take its stem cells, and grow uh, pork in a barn adjacent to the um, farm. We don't have the transportation issue. You can visit the barn on Sundays if you like, and you have full control over how your food is being produced. And by the way, our kids learn where their meat is actually coming from. So you kill a couple of birds with one stone. It's entirely possible. It illustrates that you have technology on one side and implementation on the other side. And we sort of intuitively think if, if this is going to happen, all our meat comes from a large factory in a low-wage country. But that's not necessarily the case. It's how we implement it and we have that choice. Uh, by the way, you can also do this at home. You have to know nine weeks in advance what you want to eat, but it can be done. Okay. Um, somehow this has stopped. Oh, here it is. Oh, too fast. So the other thing is, um, and, and this is something that I cannot really get my head around, is that we have a, a sort of romantic idea of meat. If we eat meat, we think about sitting on a cow, or sitting on a horse, having a lasso, uh, catching a cow, sl sliding its throat, and, and take a piece of meat out and put it on the barbecue. It's dominance over another species, it's hunting, it's um, all the sort of these more or less animalistic sort of uh, things. It's romantic, and, and we don't have that romantic vision of a lab yet. So I'm going to develop that at, at some point. Okay, um, I'm wrapping up here. So when you start to, th this is going to change the way we think about meat. And you have to realize that. Um, it can be any shape or form. It doesn't necessarily come from a live animal. You don't necessarily need to kill animals uh, for it. And um, uh, what it will eventually do is right now all you meat eaters, including myself, um, know what the problems are, we may not be too comfortable that an animal has been killed for this, and we sort of have a piece of our conscience sort of stashed far away, telling us, well, hmm, yeah, I enjoy it now, it's kind of sinful, and that may be part of the uh, appeal. But because we don't have any alternative, but if you have at some point an alternative, you have to rethink that strategy. And I think that um, this will will happen, it will, uh, we will produce it in, uh, and, and market it in a couple of years, um, and then uh, you really, then I really think those ethical questions for consumers are going to be the most important in their uh, consumption decisions. Um, thanks for your attention, I'm happy to entertain comments or questions, um, I will be around for the next day, thank you.